Good morning, and welcome to online worship here with Calvary Lutheran on the second Sunday of Advent. I have a couple of announcements to add to the little slideshow you just watched, and one of them is um, a notice of a, of a celebration, but also of Thanksgiving and of retirement. Uh, the Hunts, Kathy and Tom Hunt, for, well, since 1995, I think, uh, they have been serving as our custodians here at Calvary Lutheran and are retiring at the end of this month. So I, I wanted to lift that up. We are, uh, we are going to uh, celebrate and pray and bless them and send them on their way here in the first, uh, first Sunday of January. So uh, please mark your calendars for that. And when you see them or you on Facebook, well, they're not on Facebook, are they? And they're not on email either. Uh, but maybe you can uh, uh, give them a call or send them a note, a card to give your thanks. Um, there are uh, other, uh, the other announcement I wanted to share and emphasize is the fact that we are going to do, uh, I guess, a, a, a children's uh, a, a Christmas play that's going to be broken up in two uh, Sundays, uh, next, the Advent 3 and Advent 4. Jennifer Hunt is uh, doing a whole lot of work trying to edit all the video from the different families together. So if you are a family that has a part um, please uh, record that part and send it to Jennifer as soon as possible. Uh, there's a lot of work that goes into this, so the sooner she can get that um, recording and, that, uh, and, and edited together, uh, the better. Um, and what we have a lot to look forward to, I, I heard recently that, uh, just this last week, that the nativity scene that has been commissioned by Oak Hill Iron and Wood is completed. We have the uh, concrete uh, pads uh, uh, installed, and we're going to get that nativity up hopefully this coming week. Thanks again to uh, Tom Hunt and Bob Kilpatrick and Vern Myers uh, for helping uh, set that concrete into, uh, into place, and we will have uh, the nativity up and for you all to see here hopefully this week. All right, let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship by listening to the prelude.
Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, whose forgiveness is sure and whose steadfast love endures forever. Amen. Together, let us honestly and humbly confess that we have not lived as God desires. Loving and forgiving God, we confess that we are held captive by sin. In spite of our best efforts, we have gone astray. We have not loved, we have not loved our neighbor. We have not been Christ to one another. Restore us, O God. Wake us up and turn us from our sin. Renew us each day in the light of Christ. Amen. People of God, hear this glad news. By God's endless grace, your sins are forgiven and you are free. Free from all that holds you back and free to live in the peaceable realm of God. May you be strengthened in God's love, comforted by Christ's peace, and accompanied by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And us. In just a moment, we're going to share another video, um, a video from and blessing that Beth Spahn has put together for us to encourage us to practice our faith at home when we can't all gather here together in these four walls of the sanctuary. Uh, we can certainly gather together in the name of Christ, who is with us and present with us um, in all of our t uh, days and times. So please share that uh, video with us now before I keep stumbling over. Last week I shared with you a devotion in Table Grace to use with your nativity set. This week I'd like to share something else. A little background. I want you to know that Passing on the faith within the family is extremely important, and it's been found that there are four elements to doing this. Those are caring conversation, devotions, service, and rituals and traditions. Now last week, obviously, it was a devotion. It had a scripture reading, it had a table grace. This week, I'd like to talk about one that involves more than one thing. Caring conversations, devotions, and a ritual. You will get in your email a blessing for your Christmas tree. As you light your tree, it's a blessing to be done in the home. One person can do it, a family can do it. As you light your tree, zoom in with your family somewhere else that's lighting their tree and do the blessing together. Now for caring conversations around your Christmas tree. The Christmas tree is the ritual and tradition you've been doing for years. Take some time and have some conversation. Have each person in the family Pick an ornament that matters to them. I chose this one. It obviously is not face-based, but it matters to me. It's an ornament that was made probably 40 years ago by a neighbor, um, and I just treasured it. And a few years ago, Christmas morning, our tree toppled. The ornament broke. It's been glued together. It's been loved for 40 years, but it matters to me. Now, ask those people in your family what ornaments matter to them and why, and get that caring conversation going. Blessings. Let us pray as we light the second candle of our Advent wreath. We praise you, O God, for this circle of light that marks our days of preparation for Christ's Advent. As we light the candles on this wreath, kindle within us the fire of your Spirit, that we may be light shining in the darkness. Enlighten us with your grace, that we may welcome others as you have welcomed us. Grant this through Christ our Lord, whose coming is certain and whose day draws near. Amen. Let us continue to pray. Stir up your power, Lord Christ, and come. By your merciful protection, awaken us to the threatening dangers of our sins and keep us blameless until the coming of your new day. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Good morning, everybody. So today I brought something special to share with you. Um, this is an ornament that is on our Christmas tree at home, and 
This is an ornament that was given to me while I worked at Lutheridge. And whenever I look at this ornament, I always think about all the wonderful stories and memories I had this specific summer when I hung out with third and fifth graders all summer and many different special counselors and all the great laughs and times that we shared. And I always think about these stories when I see this special ornament on our tree. Now, the reason I'm sharing this with you is because I'm sure at home you have something special that brings up a memory or a story that brings you comfort, love. It might make you laugh and feel happy and warm inside. For today's gospel lesson, though, we hear the beginning of this special story of hope of the birth of Jesus. And I want you to listen closely to the gospel lesson as Pastor Paul reads it to hear what those words might mean. Last week, we talked about the excitement and the anticipation of the arrival of baby Jesus, and we finally get to hear the beginning of that story this week. And it brings me hope and comfort, and I hope it brings you hope and comfort as well. And so what I'd love for you to do is think about the beginning of that story or any other story that might bring you hope and comfort. You might hear the words, once upon a time, or this one time I was doing this, or any words like that that might begin a story and a memory of comfort, just like the story today, I hope brings you comfort and love as well. And I'd love to hear your stories. You can share them with me anytime whether in a video or in a Facebook post with your parents' permission, and things like that. Or maybe share those stories around your dinner table tonight or this week and why those bring you comfort and and joy. So let's pray. Dear God, thank you for family and friends that give us wonderful memories of love and comfort. Be with us as we continue to listen with open ears and hearts this Advent season. Amen. The first reading comes from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 through 11. Comfort, O comfort, my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for her sins. A voice cries out, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all the people shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, Cry out. And I said, What shall I cry? All the people are grass. Their consistency is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades. When the breath of the Lord blows upon it, surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Get you up to a mountaintop. O Zion, herald of good tidings, lift up your voice with strength. O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings, lift it up. Do not fear, says the cities of Judah. Here is your God. See, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. His his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom and gently lead the mother sheep. Here ends the reading. Have been gracious to your land, O Lord. You 
have restored the good fortune of Jacob. You have forgiven the iniquity of your people and blotted out all their sins. I will listen to what the Lord God is saying, for you speak peace to your faithful people and to those who turn their hearts to you. Truly your salvation is very near to those who fear you, and your glory may dwell in your land. Steadfast love and faithfulness have met together, Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Faithfulness shall spring up from the earth, and righteousness shall look down from heaven. The Lord will indeed grant prosperity, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness shall go before the Lord and shall prepare for God a pathway. The second reading comes from Second Peter, chapter 3, verses 8 through 15. Do not ignore this one fact, beloved, that the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, and some think of slowness, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come, all to, come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and when the heavens will pass, when the heavens will pass away with a loud noise, and the elements will be dissolved with fire, and the earth and everything that is done on it will be disclosed. Since all, things, since, since all these things are to be dissolved in this way, what sort of persons ought you to be in leading the lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of the God, because of which the heavens will be set ablaze and dissolved? and the elements will melt with fire. But in accordance with his promise, we wait for new heavens and a new earth where righteousness is at home. Therefore, beloved, while you are waiting for these things, strive to be found by him at peace without spot or blemish and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. Here ends the reading. Our gospel reading comes from Mark, the first chapter, verses 1 through 8. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Are we okay? Okay, I'm sorry, I was getting... Let me start over. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, will prepare your way, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I have been fascinated 
I've been fascinated by how great stories begin. In fact, there are a few of these first lines of novels that I have memorized simply just because I liked them. Perhaps you've heard some of these. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. The Tale of Two Cities. Call me Ishmael. Moby Dick. It was a bright, cold day in April, and the clocks were striking 13. 1984. There was a boy called Eustace Clarence Scrub, and he almost deserved it. The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. And of course, my family's favorite, Mr. and Mrs. Mrs. Dursley of number four, Private Drive, were proud to say that they were perfectly normal. Thank you very much, Harry Potter. I'm not sure why I'm fascinated by all of these openings except for the fact that they stick with me and they excite me when I recognize them in culture or in real life. The, the Bible has quite a few of these as well. It also has quite a few dozers. The biggest dozer of them all has got to be from the Gospel of Matthew. It begins as this. An account of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah. A genealogy, really? Luke is not much better, but at least it's somewhat personal and explanatory for why this is being written at all. The Gospel of John is great. I love it probably most of all, but if we were going to rank these Gospel openings as I call them, the Gospel of John gets disqualified for plagiarism because it is simply ripping off Genesis 1.1. No, I think of them all. Today is my favorite. No joke. I absolutely love the way the Gospel of Mark starts out. The beginning of the good news of, the, of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It reminds us that we, what we have here today after so many years is not just some good tidings or good advice, but good news. When was the last time anyone heard some good news in the world? Most of the headlines that I've scanned over in the past week have been pretty grim. Actually, they've been more than just grim. They've been heartbreakingly depressing and hugely concerning. Things are seriously not good in the world at the moment, and the headlines are really just the tip of the iceberg. They are just openings to the real heavy stuff that usually comes in the form of personal late-night phone calls from family members. With that in mind then, after reading this with all of you, I would like to take a moment and say, yes, give us some of that good news. And not just any good news, give us something that is truly good. That kind of news that truly makes a difference and lifts our spirits to the point we can't help but shout out, Alleluia! Give us some of that good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And the Gospel of Mark doesn't mess around either. After that opening, Mark continues to get straight to business, beginning with a headline from the prophet Isaiah in what should be in bold print with full caps, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make His path straight. At this, at this time of the year, you might be expecting angels or wise men and shepherds or something along those lines, especially when talking about Jesus in the season of Advent. I'm about as ready to sing Hark the Herald Angels Sing as anyone else, but because, I mean, come on, that's the good news we've all been waiting for, isn't it? That Christ is born? Well, apparently not. Not in the beginning of the Gospel of Mark, at least. In the Gospel of Mark, we don't get a birth story. The closest thing we get to a manger here is probably the smell coming off John the Baptist's character who walked around in nothing but camel's hair eating locusts and honey. And the Gospel of Mark begins not with the angelic messenger with bright lights and divine music, but with a very weird, dirty, and highly off-putting human messenger named John the Baptist. And yet with incredible swiftness, in just 11 verses in fact, we find that this messenger sent out ahead to prepare the way is all it takes to reveal the good news that Jesus the Christ is already in our midst 
fully grown and ready to show to the world that the kingdom of God has come near. John appeared in the wilderness to proclaim a baptism of repentance and forgiveness. These two things are not the good news. They have been around since long before Jesus was born and were core to Jewish law and the temple uh, rules. But in the baptism John proclaimed, they are the start of it. Repentance and forgiveness is the opening that clears the way and prepares for the coming of the Lord. The world needs the Savior and His good news too. But without the messenger, no one would be ready to receive Him. John's proclamation of repentance and forgiveness is necessary to open all the places, all the hearts and ears that the good news of Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, is to be heard. It is why nearly every Sunday we begin with the confession and forgiveness of sins. John's voice can be heard crying out in earnest whenever there is that need. And there is always that need for us to be opened and for the good news to begin. Repentance is a strong word. It calls for a new mind, a right about face, a life turned in a new direction. A direction pointed away from this inward isolation of self-centeredness to an outward seeking of Christ-centeredness. How much in our lives clutters the way to total repentance where we might be centered in Christ? Self-reliance. That gets in my way. Pride. Yep. Gossip. Hate. Addictions. Stubbornness. Lack of empathy or just plain caring? Constantly judging others? Demanding tolerance from God yet completely denying it to others? Believing in conspiracy rather than truth in front of our eyes? The list goes on. All these things not only clutter our lives, they block the way. Like a buildup of cholesterol where they move into the arteries of our lives almost without any effort at all. But with repentance, God's forgiveness can and will clear the way over and over again and give us new hearts. No, I mean, excuse me, uh, where did I go? Like the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 8, Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Know that nothing in our lives is too much of an obstacle for the love of God to get through to each of you, to every one of us. Now that is good news. And as the Gospel of Mark proclaims, that is not even the whole of it. In fact, that is just the beginning of it. When the way is prepared and the path made straight, then the relationship begins. Then the fellowship begins with Christ at the center where grace, life, and love abounds. John's baptism of repentance and forgiveness is important and powerful, but it is only a sign in the road pointing the way, pointing the way to the one who is even more powerful. So powerful, in fact, that John claims he is not worthy to even stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. John's baptism is with water, but his for whom the way is prepared is with the Holy Spirit. In the fellowship of Christ, we are not alone on our journeys. From the very beginning to the very end, the Lord is with you. God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I began this sermon talking about some of my favorite openings. I think it would be only fitting if I ended it with some of my favorite endings. Again, for reasons I don't quite understand, I have memorized some of these. Here's hoping I don't spoil anything for (laughs) y'all. Sorry, Finley and Henry, I'm not going to share the end of Harry Potter. But uh, here's some that I don't think you'll really ever read, maybe. We'll see. After all, tomorrow is another day. Gone with the wind. This one's dark, but I still really like it. He loved... Big Brother, 1984, again. But wherever they go, and whatever happens to them on the way, in that enchanted place on the top of the forest, a little boy and his bear will always be playing. The house at Pooh Corner. And finally, one of my favorites, 
It's not often that someone comes along who is a good friend and a good writer. Charlotte was both. Charlotte's Web. But still, my absolute favorites come from the Bible. Matthew, which has one of the worst openings of the four Gospels, has probably the best ending. With the Great Commission and the words, Remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. The Gospel of Luke ends rather so-so, but then again, we get a sequel to that one with the book of Acts. The Gospel of John ends with power and mystery and this weird, almost passive-aggressive voice that makes me chuckle thinking of how, at the end of his work, the author feels frustratingly inadequate when he states, but that there are also many other things that Jesus did. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. And then there's the Gospel of Mark, whose ending is so bad, the scribes in the early church tacked on quite a few others. A longer ending, in fact. But personally, I prefer the terrible one best. The one that ends with the women in the garden fleeing from the empty tomb because terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. I like that one so much because it's not an ending at all. It's what is called an open-ended ending that causes the reader to finish it themselves, to continue in that story that their story is becoming a part of. Because obviously that is not the way the story ends. The women had to have told someone, otherwise the author of Mark wouldn't be able to tell the story. Neither would you or I. What I really like about it, though, is that it parallels the beginning. It causes the reader to open up and prepare the way. At the end of this gospel, actually, is just the beginning of the good news. Just like John the Baptist prepares the way through his baptism of repentance and forgiveness, we, the readers, must prepare the way for the good news to break through the terror and amazement that seizes us all when we come to know and believe in Jesus the Christ. Hear the voice in the wilderness of your lives, crying out in the mess of it all to prepare the way of the Lord. There is joy in turning to see the face of Christ and knowing His forgiveness. It is good news, and it is only the beginning. Amen.
God of power and might, comfort your people and come quickly to this weary world. Hear our prayers for everyone in need. God, you teach us to wait for you with faithfulness and patience. Sustain and support us in our doubts and questions. Nurture our faith as we discern and enact your mission. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You set the stars in the sky and breathe life into the earth. Renew the face of creation where it is in need of your healing touch. Mend the wounds of environmental damage and restore balance to ecosystems so that all creation can declare your praise. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You never tire of seeking justice. Where people suffer from discrimination, judgment, and injustice, speak words of truth and comfort. Lead us toward a world where faithfulness will sprout underfoot and righteousness rain down from above. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You ask us to make uneven ground smooth. Make even the disparities between your people. Sustain and support people with physical and intellectual disabilities. Accompany disability advocates who work for a world accessible to all. Teach us to celebrate the great diversity in our midst. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You know sorrow and joy alike. We pray for those in our families and congregation who are not joyful in this holiday season. Comfort those who grieve. Be a companion to all who are lonely. Tend those who are su sick or struggling with depression. And gather all people in your healing embrace, especially during this pandemic. And especially for the family and friends of David Haru and all we name now, either out loud or silently in our hearts. Tom Mills. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Eternal God, we give thanks for the saints who have prepared your way in the wilderness and taught us to continue their faithful work. Make their generous lives an example for all. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Draw near to us, O God, and receive our prayers for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our story of generosity for today is one of great celebration. I wanted to share with you the fact that we have met both of our challenges. We have over 60 uh, intent cards turned in, and that means we have our, will be receiving those uh, one-time gifts of $10,000 and $5,000. I want to say thank you, and well done, good and faithful servants. It is exciting to, move, to look forward into this uh, 2020 year, our 20, the year of 2021, this coming year, uh, with all the opportunities we will have for ministry, with the generosity that we are growing upon in the, as a culture here at Calvary Lutheran, even in the midst of a pandemic, the ways that we can do ministry, God is opening our eyes to them and opening our hearts as well through the fruits of the Spirit. But as you see here, especially generosity. Let us say, uh, pray. Generous God, you have created all that is, and you provide for us in every season. Bless all that we offer, that through these gifts the world will receive your blessing. In the name of Jesus, Emmanuel, we pray. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.
peace. Prepare the way of the Lord. Thanks be to God.